Hello, my name is James Skelton. I am the technical evangelist here at Paperspace. Thanks so much for coming today to our talk about using deep learning to generate artwork with VQGAN Clip. Um, if you're not familiar with us, Paperspace provides infrastructure to allow data scientists and machine learning scientists to get easy access to powerful GPU compute for your ML or DL projects through the cloud. Without further ado, let's get started with our presentation today. We're going to be talking about image synthesis, as I said, so we're going to start with a image generation overview, looking at GANs and vector quantized variational autoencoders in particular. And then we're going to talk about what a VQGAN actually is, uh, its development, uh, the architecture underlying it, and its use cases. We're going to follow that with the second part of the VQGAN CLIP network, which is CLIP. Uh, talk about its development and underlying architecture. Then we're going to look at how you can put them together and the PixRay project, which has PixelDraw, which is the, uh, the, the method we are using to actually create our art with VQGAN Clip. Uh, I also want to point out over here on the right, this is just an example of some of the art you could make. Um, this is a dragon flying over Hong Kong. So let's talk about GANs. Um, really quick, I do want to say, if you're not familiar uh, with the topic, image synthesis is the process of creating artificial images using models trained on image data sets. And one of the most powerful tools for image generation is the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. Uh, a GAN works by taking some input as random noise, of random noise, I should say, uh, into a generator which transforms that random noise into synthetic data, G of Z. This uh, synthetic data is an input to a discriminator, uh, which then compares that with a sample of true data to determine how likely that synthetic data is to be perceived as true or false. This assessment is then passed back to the generator so that it can iteratively improve on the synthetic data that it is creating. The next type of image generation model we're going to talk about is the vector quantized variational autoencoder. Um, in traditional variational autoencoders, the latent space uh, is continuous and is sampled from a Gaussian distribution. Um, what that basic, in practice, what that means is that the uh, recorded features of the data are as are basically mapped as probability distribution. So uh, the likelihood of an image containing, let's say a smile uh, for somebody who is flat faced would be a close, you know, a neg close to a negative one distribution and somebody who is smiling very highly would be close to a one with a big spike there. Um, instead, very uh, VQVAEs, which are vector quantized variational autoencoders operate on a discrete latent space, which makes the optimization problem a lot simpler. It does so by maintaining what's called a discrete code, a discrete code book as an embedding space. Uh, this code book allows the uh, embedding of discrete, the, ah, excuse me, fumble. <laughs> the code book is developed by discretizing the distance between continuous embeddings of the image data and the encoded outputs. These discrete code words are then fed to the decoder, which is then trained to generated reconstructed samples. Um, that reconstruction error from the reconstruction process is then back propagated to the encoder so that it is able to learn for, from each stage of the reconstruction process how to make better and better synthetic data. And in this case, the synthetic image would just be, you know, based on the inputted data. So it, it wouldn't have a prompt or anything like that. In order to make something like that, we would need something like VQGAN clip. Speaking of VQGAN, let's look at the Vector Quantized Generative Adversarial Network. Um, it was first introduced in the paper Taming Transformers for High Resolution Image Synthesis by Esser et al. earlier this year. And they made it with the intention of improving the, what they perceived to be the, the flaws of other gener, uh, image synthesis frameworks or models like the trans, like more transformer convolutional approaches and sought to surpass those capabilities by creating their own two-stage approach. So there had been prior implementations like 
variational autoencoder GAN and things like that. But uh, they were able to create a network that outperformed those, or at least performed up to par. And we can see here in this image what that looks, how, how the VQ GAN would actually do that. Um, takes it into this code book, much kind of like we saw with the vector quantized VAE. But let's look at what that actual architecture looks like. So as I mentioned, it, it works pretty similar to a VAE GAN. Um, the key difference between the two is that the VQ GAN uses a discriminator in perpetual loss to keep good perceptual quality. This is done in a two-stage manner. First, the VQ GAN is trained to learn the image's visual parts and code word representation in the form of a quantized code book indices of their embeddings. An encoding of an image can be represented as a sequence from this code book. Then an autoregressive transformer is trained using the sequential input from the code book with sliding attention to learn long range interactions across visual parts. So basically it's trained to predict the next indice in the sequence and that allows it to learn much more finer details and the connections between the coarse and fine details. So what are some use cases for having such high quality image generation? Well, it's a boon to a lot of different industries. Um, in particular, I thought of advertising first. Um, imagine being able to automatically generate millions of stock photos um, for any kind of situation that you input yourself. So that would save hundreds of hours and resources um, just to create those. Another example would be video games. Um, Let's take something like character model design. This is a really labor intensive and artistically intensive process uh, where you have to try and create unique characters over and over again. And for larger games that can be in the scale of thousands. Um, and if we could automate that, that would save designers and engineers working on video games, thousands of hours that could be then put into making higher quality uh, actual game features. And finally, the obvious is machine learning. Uh, how nice would it be able to be able to generate a set of images corresponding to their label prompts that are high quality to train image classification models on? Um, that would save thousands of hours in tasks like, I don't know, image labeling. Um, really just being able to generate high quality images of any kind using a neural net is a super useful thing. And VQGAN is very capable of doing that. Really quick, I want to point out uh, an example from the Pixray project. Uh, at the beginning, I showed you a pixel drawing. This was made using the, I believe, clip drawer um, uh, script as opposed to pixel draw. This is just a, another one of the options. I'll talk about that in a bit. But they input as their prompt Squid Game uh, and I, by, I, I apologize, I cannot remember the creator's name. and uh, as you can see, it, it looks like some squid-like creatures playing something like games. We've got like some squares right here. This almost looks like a domino to me. I, I, I get the, uh, the game-like vibe. And also, if you've seen the show, uh, the coloration is markedly similar. Uh, all right. So next, let's talk about the second half of VQGAN Clip, which is Clip. Uh, it was first introduced also earlier this year in the paper Learning Transferable Visual Models from Natural Language Supervision by Radford et al. And it was devised to reach high levels of performance on image classification data sets of great diversity. So it's what we call a zero shot capable NLP model for supervising the generation of images that was created to be both general and flexible in its classification scenarios. Um, I wanted to quickly say, if you're not familiar, in computer vision scenarios, uh, zero-shot learning models uh, are capable of learning parameters for seeing classes along with their class representations and rely on representational similarity among class labels so that during inference, instances can be classified into new classes. Uh, in short, that means that they're capable of working on a very general and flexible array of situations. Uh, think something like GPT-2. Um, incredibly flexible model right there. And here is just a quick example of what that might look like. Uh, on the right, got a picture of guacamole. Um, I, 
as a Texan, I'm slightly offended by this photo of guacamole because it's sculpted, but it, it it's pretty clearly guacamole. And I think that the classifier you know, saw that and gave it a 90.1% and it was able to correspond the image to the inputted text prompt. Next, we got airplane and it can see that it is most likely to be an airplane. And the other thing I wanna point out is it's got some other possibilities here that it's listing like things that it could be, but it outputs the highest likelihood. Um, this is a super powerful tool. Uh, being able to use this in a plethora of situations can definitely speed up a lot of different problems in life. Um, but we're gonna talk first about the architecture. So how does this actually work? Uh, Clip works by training an image encoder and text encoder simultaneously to match the image descriptions to images themselves. That text encoder can then create the zero-shot classifier by embedding the names or descriptions of the target data sets classes. And we can see here, just on an abstract way, what that'll look like. Pupper, the Aussie pup, text is entrained, is trained at the same time the or in, I'm sorry, encoded with the image of the pup here. Uh, and then once we take out that text encoding and compare it to the photo, we are able to see that that corresponding encoding lets us out, pull out that, oh, it's a dog. So let's look at what putting all that together is. The Higan plus clip allows us to create a supervised image generation process that can be directed using user inputted text prompts. In practice, this means that the VQGAN will generate some noisy image at the beginning. This image will be assessed by clip as to whether it matches the prompt we have. That assessment is back propagated to VQGAN and that then updates its own image generation process based on that assessment. And then I'll continue doing that iteratively for in training epochs. And right here, I've got an example again of some of the clip art that you can make. This one is Jerry Garcia playing in front of an angel choir. Um, those were the exact words. So I wanted to point out really quickly um, some of the limits of using something like this. So I said Jerry Garcia. This is, for those of you who don't know, a, a decent visage of Jerry Garcia. I would say these are very much looking like a choir in the background. It kind of gets messed up by the wing here, but very much a choir. Um, and Indy's playing an instrument. The thing that it didn't manage to capture is that I wrote an angel choir. So that implies a connection, not between Jerry and the angel wings, but between the choir and the angel wings. And it wasn't able to put that down. Like you can see kind of an attempt maybe here, but I think in, as training went on, that might have been squashed out and replaced with that sort of gradient background color image. So there are limitations to something like this, but it can still be very powerful at in interpreting what you are inputting to get the best out of it. And the project that we're going to look at that really did this well is the Pixray project. Um, so this is written by Dribda, and you'll be able to find it in the resource list at but you can also find it at github.com slash D-R-I-B-N-E-T slash Pixray. Uh, and it's a wonderful project I definitely recommend you look at. In particular, within that GitHub, it mentions that it combines the work of some previous projects, uh, perception engines, clip-guided GAN imagery, and navigating latent space with sampling generative networks. If this is a topic, if, if this project is a topic of interest to you, I definitely recommend you read through those three repos and papers. They are wonderful explanations, and they really get into how a lot of the underlying work Pixray does it was rendered capable. Um, I also want to point out that Pixray has three different styles of drawers you can play around with, and I definitely recommend you do. Uh, they are line draw, pixel draw, and clip draw. Uh, because we're using the pixel drawer, which is from a, a previous iteration of Pixray, you won't have access to, I believe, line draw, which is an, instead replaced with VQGAN draw. Um, does a pretty similar thing. No, I think it's clip draw. Pardon me, clip draw. Um, but it, it, they all impart different styles upon the image that they're creating. Um, finally, this potent combination, you can launch it on your local machine with Docker. And if you go to the GitHub, it'll show you how to do that using COG. 
or you can run it on Gradient using the available Docker file we have uploaded to the Docker Hub. And you can see how to do that on a blog I made um, at blog.paperspace.com slash how I made this article's cover photo with VQGANGLIP. And um, I also have a YouTube guide on there. But while we are here, I'm going to start walking through how you can set up and run it on Gradient yourself. So if everybody could go on to consult.com slash or consult.paperspace.com. And if you don't have an account, go ahead and sign up. It takes just a moment. Uh, you don't ever have to put in your credit card if you don't want to pay for anything because we have free GPUs. And I'm going to show how you can set up this procedure on a free GPU. So the first thing you're going to want to do is once you go in there, oh, I apologize, I skipped over a step. Go in there, go into your uh, console, and you're going to be in projects. If you don't have one created, create a new project. It'll be right in the center. Uh, if, you do, if you do have a project you want to work in, go ahead and click into there. That'll then take you to this notebooks page. In, in the center of the notebooks page, unlike mine, because I already have an existing one, there will be a create your first notebook prompt. Go ahead and click on that. If you've already done this before, you can just create in the top right. This will take you to the create a notebook page. Wait a second, make sure everybody gets in there. All right. Once you're on the create notebook page, scroll down to advanced options. And this is going to be very important. Now I've already set this up before, so I can kind of skip a stage here. But you're going to want to put your container name as paperspace slash clip dash pixel draw colon Jupiter. This is our Docker image that we created to run with Gradient to facilitate your work on this. Um, you, definitely want, you definitely want to have that Docker container, otherwise you're going to spend 30 minutes trying to install things and it, it, it gets messy. So definitely use that. Um, one, oh, pardon me, I did not have this up. The other thing you're going to want to do is go to our github.com slash Gradient AI homepage and find the pixel draw, clip it pixel draw repo. And in the workspace URL section, input that as your workspace URL. This will pull in all those files for you, save a little bit of time. The last thing you need to do is go to select a machine and select free GPU. Um, Depending on your tier, you'll have different kinds of free GPUs available. For those of you who are following along that are just on the free tier, don't worry, you'll be able to run everything. Click on this free GPU. Um, for those of you who want this to run a little bit faster, I definitely recommend using something like a, I, I did this with a V100 because I wanted it to run very quickly, um, but it will run as long as you make sure to lower the, basically the resolution of the images you're doing on any of our GPUs. Um, for higher quality though, you will need something like a V100 or a 100. So now that we've set that all up, let's start our notebook. Now it will take a minute to set up. This is a very large Docker file. So in the meantime, I've just gonna walk us through what we have to work with here. So the first thing you're going to want to do once this page comes up like so is on the left hand side, we have our file navigator. Go ahead and click into uh, pixeldraw.py. This is going to be how we actually run the pixel drawer. This is where we have all our settings input. Um, this is just due to a quirk of gradient with IPy widgets that look out in the future, very near future will be resolved, but right now we run it through the terminal. So uh, go down to pass this, run the script section, line 14, and on we have our settings. Uh, this prompts variable is the first one I want to call attention to. Oh, look, it's already started running. This will be the prompt that we input that Clip will assess the image with. Um, you can do anything you want in here. It is very general and very capable. Uh, one that I did the other day. This is uh, machines. Ah, this is machines making art. This is uh, Chris Pratt as Super Mario, in celebration of his uh, 
his new casting. And I did this with the line drawer, which is one of the other optional drawers you can use. But as you can see, this is, I think this, it's got the greens and red of Mario um, looking, you know, a little tuby. And I think this does kind of remind me of Chris Pratt's energy with the way he's doing it. I think it's, I think it did a fantastic job on what I would consider a relatively obscure prompt. So feel free to go a little wild with this. Um, so let's try out one. Let's do, um, how about Tom Brady? Uh, what's that pose he did? Pose losing Super Bowl. <laughs> I hope I'm not upsetting any Boston fans out there. Um, the next setting we have is aspect. This will determine the shape of our outputted image. You can either do widescreen or square. Pretty straightforward. Uh, next is use pixel draw. This will tell our um, drawer whether and what type of drawer to use. So you can do use pixel draw. You could also do use clip draw. Um, and if you scroll down here, we can see how we actually do it with the add settings method. And prompts is equal to prompts. Aspect is equal to aspect. Oh, don't do that. There we go. Um, one thing I want to point out in particular for those of us using um, the free GPUs is that if you have this quality set to better, it will not work, unfortunately. So you can do normal or draft, and that will get you the low quality images that this GPU will be capable of working with. So keep that in mind. If you're getting an out of memory error, that is likely why. You can go here to this add settings and change your quality, and that will make it run a lot easier. You can also change your scale here. And I'll just change the scale of the image. Uh, finally, uh, from before I had use pixel draw equal true. Um, and that will get us this pixelated image. Sorry, that's the starting image. This pixelated type of image. Whereas if we were to use uh, the other example was clip draw. Did I? Sorry, let me confirm. Yes, clip draw will get us this sort of more line drawing thing. It looks like random strokes across a canvas. So let's just hash this out because we don't need it. Uh, we're going to be using pixel draw. And ooh, very important last setting that will be hashed out when you pull this up. You can change the number of iterations that we will have for our training. So in the interest of having a quick training time. Let's say you just want to get a good look at what it looks like. You can set this to something as low as, you know, let's say 10. Um, this will, each iteration on our free P4000 should run about six seconds. So this will take about 30, 60 seconds, a minute to run. Now that we've got all our settings, clip it dot apply settings, we'll apply those to a settings variable that we create. And then you can do do init settings and do run settings, and it will use those settings for a run. Um, I didn't mention this, but we also have reset settings at the top here. That way, the clip it variable is reset each time we run it. Just good practice to make sure that no holdovers ever get in the way of our generation process. And now that we've done all this, um, if you haven't yet uh, spun up one of these notebooks before, you will need to run this first cell to clone all the repos that are relevant for this project. Um, once you've done that, you can finally actually start your image generation. So go down to this cell, run it, and you'll see, aha. See, this is why you have to do the install. I was misled by these empty directories, pardon me. So you may want to do this instead while you are uh, preparing for setting up your uh, .py file for pixel draw, but that's okay. This will just take a moment.
In the meantime, I have a few questions in the chat. I'll just answer really quick. Um, I saw somebody asking if I know this will work for distributed computing. I actually don't have an answer for that. Um, I didn't see any mention of it through the repo, but you know, it's worth perusing through there. Definitely recommend you look through that. Um, I also, uh, yeah, again, the repo is dribnet slash pixray. You can find all the information about that in there. And let's see, is there another question? Oh, okay, somebody's getting out of memory. Yeah, if you're getting out of memory error, just make sure to change that. Oh, sorry. Always fun when those things appear. Uh, make sure to change this quality in line 26 to be normal. And I also found that changing the scale down helps too. It's literally the, the size. Okay, now that we've got all this right, it should run. We're only running for 10 iterations, so it should be very quick once it gets started. There we go. Oh, it looks like it needs to do an install. Yeah, oh, I forgot. First time you run this, it will do a quick install. Two quick installs. Well, while we wait for this to load, here is the uh, Gradient AI repo that we use. You can find a video guide to setting up this here on YouTube in case you want to follow up after this. And we also have information on how to set it up here if you lose any of my verbiage I said here today. So don't worry, we can. Setup is easy. All right. Running a little quicker than I thought. Cool. Just 10 iterations, so should spit out just about now. All right. Deeply ugly photo. But as you can see, it's trying to go from this sort of, oh, apologies, completely random noise. And it's starting to shape it in some ways that the clip is in responding to, to further guide based on its assessment. And then eventually you get some sort of image like this that will correspond to whatever inputted prompt you have. So, Let's look at what this same image generation would look like with 100 iterations. All right, now that it's got a chance to run for about 100 iterations, let's look at what our new generated image will look like. Well, I can see the Patriots colors down here. It's still kind of a mess, but we can see that after 100 iterations, it's a lot, lot closer to capturing the original prompt we inputted. Try messing around with increasing your iteration uh, number. I, I think something like 500 would be much more reasonable towards developing a high quality actual representation of your image, but that is our talk for the day.
Thanks so much to everybody coming. I'm going to include a list to all these resources that I use at the end of this video. So please feel free to go through those and look at them. And uh, definitely also recommend you go to our repo for this project at gradient-ai slash clip it dash pixel draw. Uh, in the future, look out for more presentations from us. Uh, I'm going to be hosting another webinar, not webinar, apology, tech talk in two weeks. So keep your eyes open for that. Uh, we're going to be talking about StyleGAN 3. Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate all your attention, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.